Welcome back to the Fera interview series where we are taking you behind the scenes at the International Ataxia Research Conference here in Washington, D.C. I am here with Louise Corbin and Adam Vogel. And we're going to be introducing you to them and talking about some of their research. So, Louise, can you introduce yourself? Um, we, we know each other, right? And... Um, yeah. But I want, I want you to introduce yourself yes. to the rest of the community. Yes, I'm Louise Corbin. I work at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. So a long way from home. Yeah. Uh, we coordinate a, a really, we've got a large clinical research program in Friedrich Ataxia that we run out of Melbourne. Clinical trials and clinical research. And we also run a clinic. Uh -huh. So we provide a clinical service. Great. Which Adam's yeah. part of as well. Yeah. All right, Adam. Uh, well, we know each other as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Absolutely. As we were just saying, so I'm a professor of speech neuroscience at the University of Melbourne, and I focus on speech research and a little bit of swallowing research as well in ataxia. So I also work with Louise in that, that clinic, that world-famous clinic that she runs, um, and I run a company who do speech testing and drug trials. Cool. All right, All right. we're here at the International Ataxia Research Conference. Would you mind sharing some of your research and the topics of your presentations with our community? Yeah, so I'll be talking uh, this afternoon, which is great, about a, uh, an upper limb measure that I've just developed. And uh, looking at upper limb measurements is really important for clinical trials, particularly so that we can recruit people who are non-ambulant, uh, which is really important to be able to make sure we, we can have the whole community involved in our clinical trials. And so when you talk about upper limb, that obviously means the upper limbs, but does it include like chunk stability and stuff too? Well, I suppose when we're using our upper limbs, we actually need to be able to stabilise your trunk to use it effectively. So when you're reaching out, and that's what makes upper limbs important, because when we're actually reaching and stabilising and grasping, we need to have good trunk control as well. Right. So it goes into the whole process. So that if we're looking at measuring something that's just in this space here, we may not be including the whole aspect yeah, of the upper Yeah, limbs. reaching and yeah. Absolutely. So all the yeah. things you know people do in terms of using wheelchairs, um, computer access, reaching out for that glass of water, um, you know, patting their doll, picking things up off the gr off the floor, all that sort of thing that you use your upper limbs for. You actually, it's an integrated process. Yeah. So that's the thing that we're interested in, kind of measuring that whole component of it too. Beautiful. Could, could you describe the measure for us? Yes. In fact, I have something that I've just prepared. The, <laughs> the, measure, the measure is here. <laughs> Um, but it's interesting because we, we kind of talk about, so this is a spoon, it's called the Ataxia Instrumented Measure, or AIMS, yes. But it's interesting because we get kind of caught up with the technology of it, and, mm -hmm. and it's actually not just the technology that sits within the spoon. So it kind of measures uh, movements in the upper limb, but it's actually the algorithm that we've developed underneath mm -hmm. And that really taps into cerebellar control of movement, which is an area in Friedrichs that, mm -hmm. that's quite affected. Uh, and so we can really tap into the actual finessing of, of control of movement. Um, but the good thing about it is that as clinicians, we always want an outcome measure that we can relate to, yeah. that's readily translatable, that we can use in clinical trials. So what this does is actually look at the movement, um, measure the movement, develop, we've developed an algorithm, takes it up to the cloud, and delivers back to the clinician. Wow a score or a measure that we can use in clinical trials. That's amazing. So somebody would like eat with that and, yeah. and well, then it would gather data? Simu exactly. Simulate. So this little thing in here is what's simulating, what, what is gathering the data if you okay. had it turned on and connected. And the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well done. That's exactly you nailed it. <laughs> I'll give you your score afterwards. <laughs> but the good thing is, it's relevant. Everyone eats food during right, the day. It's right. really relevant to what you do, you know, in, in uh, a daily activity. We can use it in the clinic. We can use it at home too. So it's great. That looks like it was 3D printed. It was. So it's remarkable with, technology. Within it, it's got a little kind of micro-processing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, micro-processing uh, computer that, right. that picks up the movement. So it's uh, past the Kyle test, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam, could you share with us some of your research and what your presentation at the IARC 2019 is going to be? Sure thing. Well, first of all, I love this device. Though. I think it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Talking about the, the meaningfulness of outcome measures is really mm -hmm. important. And I think being able to eat appropriately is, 
it's fundamental. I know you don't actually put anything yes, in the mouth. Yes, we're very conscious of our speech pathology colleagues. So. But <laughs> I, I still think it's a, a wonderful tool. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few posters here, and I'm doing a talk on Saturday, which is on how can we use speech as a marker in drug trials effectively? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I think talking to that meaningfulness, I think speech is probably one of the most important things I that agree. we all do as humans. And it's something that goes wrong in FA. So we are really interested in making sure we can objectively measure change in someone's disease progression, but also whether or not the drug is working. And when I say objective, I mean being able to tell exactly what's going on rather than having a listener make a, a judgment about mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So it's so like um, an objective measurement of what is a fairly subjective process. Yeah. yeah. So we can listen to someone and say, oh, that sounds different, but we can't actually put a numb to that very clearly. Mm -hmm. So we use signal processing algorithms again. So it's called acoustic analysis, and that allows us to take someone's speech and then measure it and then show how it's changing over time. And so we've been using this in a few different drug trials. Um, there's a poster downstairs looking at uh, Takeda's recent drug trial, which mm -hmm. unfortunately didn't give us the results we wanted, but speech did change as a function of treatment. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a primary outcome measure, so they can't use it in that context. But mm. but it gave you a lot of data to be like, all right, this might be, this might work, and if we took it this way and that way, then it'll work even better, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few important steps that we need to make it a good tool. So speech is a good tool. We need to know how things change over a short period of time and a longer period of time just without any treatment and then we can make assumptions about whether or not that drug is effective if we see a, a sort of improvement in that, that measure. So almost like a, like a natural baseline history of speech progression in the disease to measure against expected improvement outcomes. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, as part of the initiative that we've been driving, we're also setting up a consortia called Speech Ataxia, and that's actually got sites all around the world already, and we're looking to expand that out, hopefully recruit some more sites while we're here, yeah. so we get into it. And uh, <laughs> everyone will be providing the same sort of speech samples at each clinic in different languages, and then we can make assumptions about what's going on. The in president the lives in the White House. Uh, yeah, yeah, the traffic is heavy today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they don't make the cut. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Too bad, everyone. <laughs> You've practiced it so well. But no, we're not doing it appropriate. And I think from a speech point of view, we're trying to work out what the best way of describing speech mm -hmm. is. So speech is kind of a, a nebulous concept where we talk and mm -hmm. is it how easy it is to understand someone or is it how natural they sound, whether or not they sound like they have a disease or not, or whether or not we want it to map really closely to overall disease severity. So I think mm -hmm. there's questions out there that we need to solve. I think I've got some answers for them, but mm -hmm. we are trying to find the right fit for a, a drug trial in that setting, so getting the right answer and then being able to apply it. Yeah. Nice. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Obviously, thank you for your research and your investment in the FA community. Um, for the rest of you, this is a continuing series, so there are more videos. Always check it out, the Farah interview series on Farah's YouTube channel, on Farah's Facebook page, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn. And until our next video, we'll see you later. Bye. Right. Thanks. We're ready to go whenever you guys. All right, let's do it. All right, loosen. <laughs> <laughs>